Hey everybody, Eric here. I have a few quick announcements for you and they don't have much to do with this week's episode. So I figured, hey, why not just stick them right up front? First, I wanted to announce that we've officially got our Embitterment Essentials Variety Packs back in stock after a long hiatus. So whether you've got a cocktail enthusiast on your gift list or you're looking to order these from us wholesale, we've got plenty in stock and we're ready to ship. So you can go ahead and place an order on modernbarcart.com or reach out to us any way you please. Second, I know we've been sort of spirits and brand heavy on the content lately. That's partly by design and partly due to this fateful pandemic that we're finally emerging from. Obviously, the bar world had better things to do than talk with me while they were fighting for their lives, but now that things are gradually, slowly opening up again, I'm looking to rebalance our content with more bar and cocktail-related stuff. So if there's anything you'd like to request, please reach out on Instagram or by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com and let me know. That said, we do still have some spirits-related stuff in the pipeline. September is, after all, National Bourbon History Month, so I normally try and do at least one bourbon piece for that. And this year's should be a very exciting one. Like, seriously exciting, so stay tuned for that. But I also have some awesome authors coming up who are writing on topics that we haven't yet covered, and I'm actively planning the next edition of our Breaking Bloody series. That's right, I'm going to keep beating you over the head with more Bloody Mary content. But, you know, it's going to be fun. I promise. So again, I implore you to exercise the very open and very real opportunity to get in touch and influence the kind of episodes and interviews that we put out. You're not going to get this chance with the big network-sponsored shows out there, so make sure you take advantage of it and make your voice heard. Now, on to the show. Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern bar cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 239 of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another one of our Bar Cart Foundations episodes, where we dive deep on one very specific area of the spirits and cocktail world so that you can walk away from the episode feeling like a bit of an expert on the subject. This time around, we'll explore the universe of structured tastings. Tastings that go above and beyond the little samplers you get when you visit a distillery or a fancy whiskey bar. But this kind of begs the question, right? What do I mean, beyond what I just said, by structured? At an intuitive level, if you're interested in beer, wine, cider, mead, spirits, or cocktails... I think you get what I'm trying to say. A structured tasting is one where you don't just grab from a bank of possible options. And, hey, don't get me wrong, I love visiting a local brewery when I'm traveling and telling the bartender that I'd like to sample a flight consisting of their hazy Irish red, their diet milk stout, their lingonberry shanding, and mm, the, the, the pilsner. But that's not a structured tasting. That's utter chaos. It might be delicious, but it's all about what I think I like and doesn't begin to make any progress toward the actual quality in a value sense or qualities in a descriptive sense of the products involved. At a technical level, a structured tasting is one where certain variables are controlled and manipulated. Your approach toward manipulating these variables generally denotes the kind of tasting that you're trying to engage in. Most of them have pretty straightforward names, and we'll go through them in a list-wise fashion in just a minute here. 
But before we do, I just want to take a minute to think out loud about why we engage in structured tastings of the liquids we enjoy drinking, whether that structured tasting takes place at home in the company of family and friends, at a winery or distillery where the products are created, or even in a formal judging setting or in a controlled sensory study. In general, when you carefully manipulate a variable in a structured tasting, you're trying to learn something very specific about either your own palate or the liquid in front of you. And by extension, the people and raw inputs responsible for that liquid. The latter is especially true when it comes to vertical and horizontal tastings, which are extremely popular in the wine world and which we'll cover in depth in just a minute. Another slightly more technical answer to this why structured tastings question actually boils down to something called the hard problem of consciousness. And I'm going to leave my explication of that point until the end of the show in the hope that some of the examples I illustrate along the way can do some of the explanatory work for me. So with that, let's jump in. First things first, it's important to note that not all these types of tastings are going to be great fits for all beverages and for people of all experience levels. So when I explain a style of structured tasting, I'm going to try and take some time to work through what it's best suited for and which types of distillates or ferments it might be most effective. Next, I got to admit that our first style of structured tasting is actually two styles. But in my mind, the distinction between these two styles is what splits the structured tasting world in two, like the Treaty of Tordesillas. You can go ahead and look that up on your own. This distinction is between blind tastings and non-blind tastings. And as we go through the remainder of the list, you'll notice that each of the styles we explore will fall into one of these two buckets. If you haven't put this together already, a blind tasting is one in which you, the taster, don't know the precise identity of the liquid in your glass. And a non-blind tasting is one in which that information is available to you. Now, the question becomes, if you're conducting a blind tasting, how much information will the tasters have about the liquid in front of them? If it's a barrel-aged spirit, will they know which kind of spirit it is? If it's a red wine, will they know if it's from a certain region or made with a certain grape? Or will this be a completely blind situation where the taster is really pushed to use their senses to track down the identity of what they're nosing and tasting? In one sense, a blind tasting is really great for eliminating bias. So in most of the structured tastings conducted by professionals where they're gathering sensory data from experts or just people off the street, the person or organization that sets up the test will make sure that the participants are blind to at least some degree. This is because knowing things about what's in your glass inevitably leads to unconscious associations and assumptions that can create a type of contamination that affects your objective experience of the liquid. So in situations where money or awards or prestige are on the line, blind tastings are a stay against the mental baggage we all bring into our flavor experiences. But on the other hand, what if that mental baggage isn't always a source of contamination? What if it could be a source of context that allows us to explore and compare our tastings of different ferments and distillates with an eye toward the larger forces at work, like terroir, culture, and style. Well, this is where non-blind tastings really shine. And by way of example, the first two structured tastings we'll examine during the heart of this list should give you a couple clear reasons why non-blind tastings can be so interesting. Those styles are vertical and horizontal tastings. A vertical tasting, as its name implies, is 
like a really specific drill down into the offerings of a single producer over time. Most often you encounter these in the wine world where the term vintage, which refers to the wine produced from a single year's crop of grapes, dictates a great deal of the value of a given bottling. This is because the character of a grape can vary wildly based on precipitation, temperature, and other environmental factors. So when you hear someone say, oh, it was a good year or a bad year in a certain wine region, they're referring to the average effect of the weather that year on the product quality of a whole bunch of producers. Kind of crazy how that works. In its native winery environment, A vertical tasting allows you to taste the same offering from a producer across a number of different vintages, which can show you two important factors, each in relief of the other. Of course, as I mentioned, you'll have the information about the weather and yields produced that year, essentially the geographical terroir. But the fact that you're only tasting through the wines of a single producer will allow you to contextualize that meteorological information using your palate. For example, let's say we're talking about four wines, all the same label made by the same Bordeaux producer. Two of these wines come from good to average vintages, right? Nothing crazy high quality, but you know, something positive to average. And two, come from decidedly bad vintages. One of the bad vintages was bad because it was too dry. And one was bad because it was way too rainy that year. The nice thing here is that you've got a baseline with your two average to good vintages that kind of let you know what this winemaker is capable of when things are normal. And then you taste the two reportedly bad vintages where the region was subjected to adverse weather. In the dry year, you notice that the wine just kind of seems like a shell of its former self. The flavors seem muted, muffled, anemic. But when you taste the offering from the bad because too wet vintage, you notice some surprising new flavors and aromas. Maybe they're atypical of what you would expect from normal bottling. But hey, you know what? You kind of like this slightly offbeat wine. It's different in interesting ways, not because it's lacking flavor or structure or whatever else went wrong in the dry year. Then you get out your soil map of Bordeaux because that's a thing. It's definitely a thing. Maybe the maker has better drainage than the surrounding chateaus. This is something you would examine on your nerdy little soil map. Maybe, on the other hand, they're doing something interesting with biodynamic practices, or maybe there's just something about the way this particular producer makes wine that suits them to wetter weather and really handicaps them when it's dry. This is the type of rich associative detective work that you can do in a non-blind tasting where you let your palate operate like a bloodhound, tracking down aromas and flavors, but you get the liberty of keeping your eyes up, scanning the horizon for clues about everything else that's going on. But here's a question. What if you're not into wine? Where else in the beverage world can you encounter a vertical tasting? Well, the beer world has seen a good deal of this in what I would call the past decade, decade and a half with brands that make higher alcohol stouts and barley wines, putting out annual releases that can be aged in your cellar and that will continue to develop in a neutral or positive way rather than just getting kind of skunky and flat like most lower ABV beers. So the ability to conduct a vertical tasting in the beer world is definitely on the table, but it's a more limited occurrence. In the spirits world, you can also conduct vertical tastings by collecting annual releases from generally larger distilleries, and usually those that produce scotch and bourbon. But it's important to keep in mind that this type of tasting is vertical more in name than in practice. Yes, it's true that many whiskey casks are subject to the same meteorological vicissitudes that grapevines experience, with fluctuations in temperature and humidity playing 
an important role in the end product. But when you consider that these fluctuations are averaged out over a number of years in the cask, and when you consider that most final whiskey offerings are blended anyway, you're pretty much losing any connection to the land and the weather. You're simply buying into what a blender is telling you may be different from year to year. This is why in the whiskey world, and especially in bourbon, vertical tastings have been replaced largely by a focus on different mash bills, cask finishes, and single barrels, or barrel picks. For more on that, check out my interview with OJ Lima in episode 229. This episode is brought to you by Near Country Provisions. If you're a regular listener of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast, you've heard me talk about Near Country quite a bit over the last year, and I have another exciting announcement. They've got cheese, guys. Not only do Adam and his team work with a bunch of awesome local farmers and fishermen here in the Mid-Atlantic to provide you with sustainably raised and delicious proteins, but they've upped the ante yet again, and they now offer delicious cheeses, cow's milk and sheep's milk cheeses that you can subscribe to on a monthly basis, or you can just go ahead and add them to your cart as an add-on at any point. Head over to nearcountry.com and enter the code BARCART when you sign up for your subscription to receive two free pounds of bacon or ground beef in your first delivery. That's BARCART, B-A-R-C-A-R-T, all one word, at checkout. Becoming a Near Country Provisions subscriber is easily one of the biggest quality of life improvements I've made in the last year or two, so I hope you'll give Near Country Provisions a shot and let me know what you think. Now, back to the show. These are the offerings from a single producer that enthusiasts can kind of latch onto and probe for similarities and differences with the rest of the given portfolio, but that aren't tied so much to the natural ebb and flow of the weather as in wine. This brings us to horizontal tastings. Instead of offering a narrow, dense core sample of information, these tastings take a big, wide, airy swipe across a given region or category with the goal of comparing offerings between producers. But just because a horizontal tasting is more generous in scope doesn't mean it's necessarily sloppy. You're still controlling for variables like time and place. Again, the wine world offers perhaps the best, purest examples of horizontal tastings because of the vintage system. Since each year can be radically different from the next, it actually merits considering the offerings of various producers using liquid from the same harvest. Let's do a thought experiment. Imagine you sit down with a kid every day for seven days, and every day you give that kid a piece of paper and a box of crayons, and you say, hey kid, go nuts, draw whatever you want. Now imagine that you sit down for one day with seven kids, and you give each of those kids the same box of crayons and the same blank sheet of paper, and you tell them the same thing. Draw whatever you'd like. What's different about these two scenarios? Well, in the first, what you're tracking is the progression of a single artist in a vacuum over a number of iterative occurrences. And in the second, you're tracking what happens when a number of artists are engaged in a single project right next to one another. Chances are, if you actually ran this experiment in real life, the kids would know each other. They'd look at what their neighbors were drawing, maybe influence their friends with kind or unkind words. This is exactly what happens in any beverage producing community And a horizontal tasting not only takes a snapshot of what a given vintage looks like from a weather standpoint, but it can also give you a sense of the zeitgeist of a place and time. In addition, because horizontal tastings are a little less rigid than vertical ones, they're a bit easier to adapt to the worlds of beer and spirits. In beer, you can say, hey, let's go do a horizontal tasting of four or five different regional IPA releases this spring. And in the world of spirits, you can get even more general and say, let's do a horizontal tasting of the entry-level weeded bourbons from these five different producers in Kentucky. 
As with the vertical tastings, you largely lose the strong effects of terroir when you venture into beer and whiskey. But remember, the point of a horizontal tasting is to use your palate to learn something about a whole group of different producers. And that doesn't always necessarily require anything from the weather. Vertical and horizontal tastings can be conducted and enjoyed by people of all skill levels. But behind closed doors, there's another world. A world where people wear lab coats and examine liquids under microscopes and say words like organoleptic. This is the world we're about to enter. And I'm about to spill some knowledge that might allow you to sidestep the lab coat and play around with these less well-known structured tastings at home. The first one I'd like to look at is called a triangle tasting, also known as a triangle test. This is a blind structured tasting in which a taster is offered three samples. Two of these samples are the same and one is different. And the job of that taster is to identify which sample is different and thereby which two are the same, right? So it's kind of just testing your senses against these three seemingly similar samples put in front of you. But besides being a neat parlor trick, if executed properly, what is the purpose of a triangle tasting? Well, as I mentioned, we're in the world of lab coats here. So usually we're not doing a triangle tasting with two rums and a gin, right? Something that's super obvious. Normally you're manipulating one or two subtle variables and using the feedback of a taster actually in reality, a large group of tasters to determine if that manipulation results in significant observational differences. There are two riffs on a triangle test that I think are worth bringing up here, not so much because they're radically different, but because they show how many different ways you can challenge your senses using this very basic three sample methodology. The first is essentially an upside down triangle test where instead of picking the one sample that's different from the two others, a taster is charged with identifying the two samples that are the same, leaving one as the outlier. I've heard this approach referred to as a triad test, but I'm having a lot of trouble verifying that name using solely online sources. So you'll have to pardon me if I'm incorrect on this. One slight problem with this field, once you get into lab coat territory, is that a lot of it lies behind paywalls and is conducted in the walled garden of university labs. So again, apologies if I'm getting this wrong, but if triad test is not the right name, just think of it as an upside down triangle test. The other three sample blind structured tasting you can try is called a duo trio test. In this version, you're given one sample as a reference, and then you're asked to pick which one of the two remaining samples matches it. When viewed side by side with vertical and horizontal tastings, a triad, triangle, or duo trio tasting can come off as a bit of an anticlimax. It's at best a five to 10 minute exercise, and then I mean, what, you're done? You kind of do it by yourself? You don't get to hang out with friends? What? I mean, what's the point? This is where the lab coats have an advantage. Generally, these tastings are run using a large sample size of different tasters, as I mentioned earlier, so that the results can be analyzed for statistical significance. That way, when we get the results, they can be applied to various production decisions down the line with the goal being to improve in some way or manipulate the end product so that it's more successful, right? So, you know, when you're working with the lab coats, let's face it, you're a bit of a lab rat. Some people like being a lab rat, some people don't. That's just how it goes. But this doesn't mean you can't adapt the triangle, triad, duo, trio, test paradigm for your own uses at home, right? Let's say you've got a bottle of Isla Scotch or a Napa Valley cab. Well, next time you go to the liquor store, go ahead and pick up a second bottle 
that's different but very similar in region and style, and then have a friend or a family member set up a blind tasting for you. And if you find that the color of your chosen liquids might be a dead giveaway as to the correct answer of which one's different and which two are the same, you can always just up the ante and conduct your tasting blindfolded. Just make sure if you do that, that you don't spill your samples all over the place. So again, these blind tastings really powerful when conducted in controlled settings with large numbers of participants, but that doesn't mean that we home enthusiasts can't kind of co-opt them and use them as a useful way of training our own palates. As we exit the world of blind tastings, shedding our lab coats, we enter the domain of blended wines and spirits, which can compellingly be assessed using a technique called a component tasting. This, actually, it's kind of exactly what it sounds like. When you have a whiskey blend or even a blended wine, a component tasting allows you to extract those two or more components, assess them independently, and then consider how they operate in tandem in the final product. So you're constantly shuffling between the individual ingredients and the finished blend, kind of tasting, nosing, and trying to pick out how the parts contribute to the whole. One unique aspect of a component tasting is that generally you won't be able to conduct this on your own. This isn't like the soda fountain at a fast food restaurant where you can just make your own Frankenstein drink by adding different sodas to your cup. Distilleries and wineries release blends that are carefully crafted by their own master blenders or blending teams to reflect the absolute best of what they have available in a given vintage or resting in barrels in their rickhouse, i.e. stuff you don't have available to you on shelves at liquor stores. So the component tasting is generally and unfortunately reserved as an educational tool for those on and off-premise professionals who are tasked with ultimately selling those bottles and pours to the end consumer. Most lay people, unless you've got a really awesome distillery near you or you're a VIP on a mailing list or something, won't have a chance to experience a component tasting. Still though, I think this is an opportunity. I'd love to see more distilleries and wineries offering this sort of interactive experience to the public. It's a really undervalued way of showing people the kind of work you do in service of the products you make. And if we're lucky, hopefully the term and the practice will become more of an open discussion moving forward. This brings me to our final structured tasting format of the episode, and this is one that I didn't even know existed until a little over a month ago at Tales of the Cocktail. Unfortunately, I have to keep the brand and the blend details a bit generic because I'm, honestly, I'm trying to do a write-up of this event to see if I can get it published in print, but suffice it to say, I took part in what I can only call an inverted component tasting. What the heck does that mean? Well, there's a brand that's out there launching a new blended whiskey, and this whiskey has a bunch of different blend components. It's complicated. It took a long time and a lot of resources for this rather large company to put out this product. And when they walked me and a bunch of other drinks journalists through this blend, they did something rather ingenious. I'm not saying it's unprecedented just because I don't have any you know, past record of this occurring. I'm sure somebody's thought of it before, but still, it was rather ingenious. Instead of simply presenting us with the lineup of blend components and letting us taste them alone one by one, they instead presented us with a lineup of mostly finished blends, each with one component missing. In this way, as we tasted through and then proceeded to revisit glasses we had already nosed and tasted, we could begin to understand the role of each ingredient based on what was missing when it was gone. To me, this is a really intimate way to experience a complicated blend, and unfortunately, it's not going to be the right way to approach most component tastings. But in the right context... I think what this inverted component tasting does better than any other 
is put us in touch with the work of the master blender at a point in her or his process that most of us don't have any insight into. The point where the blend is almost where it needs to be, but where something is still missing. If you'd like to make the argument that a great blend is more than the sum of its parts, this is a moment in the process that should do more work than any other to prove or discredit the work of the hands and minds behind the liquid. So if I'm looking at smaller brands and saying, hey, give us more component tastings, then in the same vein, I'm looking toward those bigger brands out there and advising them to take a note of this striking new way to offer an insight into the art and science of blending. Back at the beginning of the episode, I mentioned that I was saving one of my answers to the question, why do a structured tasting, until the end of the show. And part of the reason for that was because I wanted you to see a bunch of different ways that these tastings are undertaken and maybe just begin to get a feeling for what they're all designed to accomplish. If you think back on the different things that I've described, the vertical and horizontal, the triangle triads, the component tastings, the inverted component tastings, they're all looking at slightly different things. They all have slightly different projects in front of them. I also mentioned that this answer had something to do with a concept called the hard problem of consciousness, which is a very specific philosophical term that we can't even begin to define in full this late in the episode. But one of the aspects of the hard problem of consciousness that repeatedly confounds philosophers is the notion of qualia, or the actual process of experiencing experience, the what it's likeness of being human. The blue of the sky, the smell of fresh cut grass, the sound of rain, the pain of childbirth, these are all phenomena that scientists have been able to operationalize based on rods and cones in your eye, the tympanic membrane in your ear, the taste buds and olfactory receptors in your mouth and nose. But all that mechanistic explanation can't actually reproduce a given experience, leaving us with a version of the problem posed by 18th century philosopher George Berkeley, who wondered, how we could prove that our experience of a red rose or a red apple or a red strawberry was the same experience that everyone else was having. This is a question that goes back centuries and centuries. The reason why the hard problem of consciousness is so hard is because there's no way of getting around it. Even our best science to date hasn't been able to do that. But if there's one thing I've learned, from sitting around many tables engaging in many different types of structured tastings through the years. It's this. The hard problem of consciousness doesn't seem so hard when you're nosing and tasting a spirit or a nice glass of wine and someone pulls out a tasting note that transports you back to childhood or hits exactly on that one taste or aroma note you couldn't quite put your finger on. In these moments, it's clear that your red is their red. Your fresh cut grass is their fresh cut grass. And when you can achieve that kind of shared experience with someone, that level of deep embodied understanding, certain things just kind of start falling into place. By putting structure into your tastings, you give yourself a chance to confirm that you and someone else are experiencing the world in the same way through your senses, thereby solving, if only for a fleeting moment, the hard problem of consciousness. And if you do happen to come up with contrary tasting notes, then guess what? It's an opportunity for you to consider the liquid in the glass in front of you from a perspective that's delightfully outside of your own, which is, in itself, a mind-expanding project.
I'm Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. I hope this exploration of the different styles of structured tastings in the fermented and distilled beverage world has given you a little bit of inspiration as you look ahead to autumn and holiday gatherings where you can share flavors and experiences around a table with friends. If you have any questions or want advice for how to set up your next structured tasting, please go ahead and drop us an email at podcast at modernbarcart.com and my team and I will be happy to point you in the right direction. Until then, please make sure to, as always, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. Cheers. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here. And by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed and structured tasting insights, courtesy of yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2022.